As we dive back into the Gospel of Mark in this season, now that Lent and Easter and Pentecost have passed us by and we are back to what we sometimes call ordinary things, we are confronted with one of the stranger episodes in Jesus' life an episode where he is trying to have dinner. And there are so many people crowding in to hear him, to see him, to touch him, that they can't even eat, or so it is said. We also hear about his family, those that he probably loved as much as you or I love our, the members of our family, and they are coming to him and they are thinking to themselves, gosh, he's gone nuts, he's gone crazy. He is out of his mind. We use phrases like that all the time. Have you ever said to somebody, well, he's beside himself? That's actually the phrase that is used here in this gospel text. He is beside himself. What that means is the person is like two people now, one standing here and one standing there, and the one that is standing there is the right one and the one that is speaking is the one that's not altogether there. Or we sometimes tell people, get your stuff together. Sometimes using different words, but there it is. Again, that somehow we're being divided within ourselves. That's in scriptural terms what this being crazy really means. And he hears all of this, and he says to people around him, he tells them a parable, he tells them a story. It's typical Jesus, rather than speaking plainly, he's going to tell them a story to teach them something. And the wonderful thing we know about parables is there's always something in there that we can identify with, something in there that we can learn from. And I'll leave it at that for the moment. But I want to talk about this particular passage because it's a marvelous passage from the Gospel of Mark to really get at what the true meaning of all of this is. We have to see it in a certain way. And that certain way is the way that this particular lesson is constructed. If you'll notice, one of the first things we hear about in the lesson is about Jesus' family. And what is the last thing we hear about in the lesson? Jesus' family. So we need to think for a moment what this lesson is really about. It's not really about calling to mind all of this stuff about demons and houses divided against themselves and blasphemies and all that sort of thing. It is that, of course, but the real focus of this lesson is the family. Jesus' family. And so we have to dive into that that reality. I'm going to ask you a question. Now, why would they think that Jesus is beside himself, that Jesus has sort of lost his mind, that Jesus hasn't got his stuff together? What is he doing? He's sitting there trying to have dinner. But who are all the people right around him? They're certainly not acceptable people. They're not the righteous people. They're not the right standing people in the eyes of society. They're the marginalized, they're the people pushed to the edge. They are the homeless, the hungry, they are the ones who are ill, they are the ones who need cleansing, they are the ones who, who need healing, they are the ones who are prostitutes and tax collectors, and you name it, they're there. These are the ones pressing on Jesus and he's not chasing them away. And so the righteous people, Scribes, they're saying, this isn't right. This can't be right. He's inviting all these people to be with him, so he must actually be in league with Satan. After all, righteous people don't associate with sinners. After all, people who in those day and age, we have to remember and remind ourselves that anybody who was unfortunate enough to have a disability that we call today some sort of, some sort of disability, that they were cursed of God. That they were seen to be less than whole people. 
In fact, we might recall that passage in the Gospel of John where Jesus is dealing with a blind man and his own disciples ask him the question, why is this man blind? Is it because of his sin or his parents' sin? So that kind of disability, that kind of shortcoming was seen to be not simply a misfortune of life, but rather was seen to be a product of sinfulness. So the more sick people, the more disabled people, the more marginalized people Jesus draws to himself, the more they're saying, see, see, he likes these people, he likes these sinners, therefore he must be one of them. And so he must be in league with the prince of demons. He must be in league with the lord of the flies. That's what Beelzebub means. He must be of the house of Satan. Jesus, of course, has a very clear teaching suddenly about that. And he uses their own logic against them. He, they're saying, well, if I'm casting out demons and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm doing it, how can, you know, I, I'm destroying Satan's house. This house will not stand long if, the, if it's him working against himself. And then he goes on to this notion of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about this notion of being crazy. Several years ago, general convention, uh, what is the person who is now our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, was then the bishop of North Carolina. He preached one of the most marvelous sermons I had ever heard. Uh, it's now been, of course, popularized and put into books and all that sort of thing. These things really do take off sometimes. He talked about crazy Christians, about saints. In fact, he was talking about Harriet Beecher Stowe at the moment, but he said she was a crazy person, a crazy person, because she was giving witness to this Jesus and the freedom that Jesus represented the dignity that Jesus declared and demanded for all people. She was nuts. She was crazy. She was beside herself. She didn't have her stuff together by the standards of her day. She was crazy. She even underwent prejudice and was rejected because of her stance on these matters. Why should she be any different? Isn't that what happened to Jesus? But there he is, sitting there trying to have dinner, and the, all of these people are pressing in on him, and now all of a sudden, who shows up but his family? Did you ever notice family always shows up at the most inopportune times? So he's having this fight with the scribes, the leaders of his time, the people who other, everybody else looked up to, and probably also his family. And they were seeing this, and they said, this can, no good can come from this. No good. Nope, 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 nope. Let's get him out of here before something bad happens. And so they come to get him. <laughs> and he turns on them. That doesn't sound like our Jesus now does it. Kindly, wonderful, fuzzy-wuzzy Jesus. The one who espouses family values. And then that's something, too, we need to come back to. But the, this notion that Jesus will also reject his own brothers and sisters and his mother in favor of these crazy people. What would you think about me if all of a sudden, right in the middle of this sermon, people started to flood in through all of the open doors? It's so warm outside, we have all the doors open, people are listening to what we're saying, and if all of a sudden we got people walking in, people who... You're not used to being around people who smell a bit, people who don't look like they've had a change of clothes in several weeks, people who maybe were sleeping on the street last night, somebody maybe who still is sort of suffering a bender from being on too much alcohol or perhaps having a drug addiction problem. They start flowing in here. What would you do? What would you think? And then I say, come here, come here, come here, come here. Sit up here with us. You might say the same thing. He's gone off his rocker. But that's what Jesus did. 
So maybe we're not so far off from the people in this particular lesson, not so far off from the scribes, perhaps, or even his own family, people who cared about Jesus very, very much. And they wanted to save him from himself. And he says, these are my family. These prostitutes, these drug addicts, these homeless people, these people who don't shower very often, these people who are not very comfortable, but they're here and they're my family, so I love them like I love my family. What witness is Jesus giving to the very love of God and the demand that is made of us in our baptismal vows when we are asked, no, we are told, and we promise to do this, to seek Christ in every person, and to respect the dignity of each and every human being. Full stop. No conditions are placed on that. None. We don't respect your dignity only if you do X, Y, Z, or you meet this criteria or that. We don't seek Christ in the face of every person simply because they look good and holy and wonderful. We seek Christ in the lost and the forlorn. We seek Christ in the homeless and the unfortunate. We seek Christ on those that are pushed to the edge, to the margin. That's where Christ is most clearly seen. Because there is no question as to why we are loving that. We are not loving them for anything we can get from them. We are loving them with the pure grace and love of God. And that is witness to the gospel. It ain't easy. I know that. And so if you're feeling a little squeamish about that sort of thing, I, I, I get it. But yet, that is what we are called to do. That is how we are called to grow in this ordinary time. To grow more in love, not only with the people that we are comfortable with, our own family perhaps, even the family of this parish, but rather the people out there who are in need of love and grace and forgiveness of God. Jesus says only one thing is required. Only one thing, he tells us today, that they do the will of God. Now, too often, we decide what the will of God is. So you have to do this and this and this and this. That's what the scribes were doing. Now, we know what the will of God is. At the 8 o'clock service at Rite 1, we profess this. Hear what the Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. And the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the only thing that we are required to do to be doing the will of God. And once we have received and accepted the love and the grace of Christ, that is what changes and transforms our life. We don't change and transform in order to receive grace, but rather it is the abundant grace of God that descends on us in the Holy Spirit, and that alone makes us righteous. Regardless how we smell, regardless of what addictions we have, regardless of the problems that we may face in our daily lives, that makes no difference to Christ. Should we remain there? No. No. But what lifts people out of that reality is the love of God expressed in us. Expressed in us. So rather than pushing these people away, pushing them to the margin, saying they are not worthy, we invite them in. We make them our brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus would do. This blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, that sort of sticks in my craw all the time. Everybody's always kind of having a hard time with it. And I think there's kind of a simple explanation of that. You see, because as I mentioned already, the grace of God is so abundant and so complete that no one is beyond God's forgiveness. No one except those that will not be forgiven. 
If you refuse to be forgiven of God, if you refuse to repent, if you refuse to acknowledge the shortcomings in your own life, you cannot be forgiven because you don't think you did anything wrong. And if that's the case, how can we be forgiven? We can't accept forgiveness for nothing. But the reality is we know, we know deep down in our hearts that none of us is without stain, none of us is without sin. But once we acknowledge that, once we acknowledge that that love and grace is available to each and every human being, and we live that reality, then we are saved. The grace of God floods over us. And as long as we remain with open hearts and arms to that grace and that forgiveness, we grow and grow and grow, and we become powerful in the Spirit of God. This is a circular reading. I've said that already a couple of times. We're going to come back to another thing. You notice where it says the crowd came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat? It just sounds like it's an inconvenience, right? Well, actually, in the, in the scripture, in the language in which it was written, not the way it was translated, it says they could not eat bread. And if you study the Gospel of Mark, you see that every time bread is mentioned, what he is talking about is the Holy Eucharist. So the cares and concerns of the world were pressing in on Jesus so that he could not eat bread. Would that it would be so, that people would be pressing us in here to see Jesus, to hear Jesus, to, 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 to be touched by Jesus, such that we couldn't even celebrate what we normally do because we were so busy taking care of that. Who are my brother? Who are my sisters? Who is my mother? These, Jesus says. This is my family. The broken, the lost, the injured, the sick, the dying, the forlorn, the abandoned, the abused. We could go on and on. And Jesus says, these are the ones I love. So, friends, when we hear those marvelous words, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, these are the ones, Jesus tells us, to love like family. May it be so. May the grace of God fill our hearts this day. May the power of the Spirit give us strength and courage that we will give that same witness to our broken world. May we be Christ for one another and for others now and all.